So uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, once again, um, everyone joining us for our fifth and sadly final session of uh, MMU Gothic Approaches, uh, for now at least. Uh, and to everyone tuning in for the first time, that well, it's better late than never, I guess. Um, I'm Oliver Rendell. I'm here to reintroduce the city, uh, the series, not the city, once again, and will be acting as chair for tonight's session as well. Uh, as usual, if I could ask everyone to keep your mics and cameras off. Uh, for the duration of the papers at least, and to throw all of your questions and comments in the chat. Um, and please do let us know where you're joining in from as well and how you found out about the series. Uh, it's lovely to know, you know, who we're reaching out to. Uh, we're going to be recording the event, as you can probably see on your screen now. Um, so keep your, uh, you know, your screens off uh, if you don't want to be recorded. Uh, but all of these sessions are ending up on YouTube, uh, a few of them up already, I think all of them are up already, I think. Um, so you can catch up with them as and when or recommend them to other people or reference them, in fact, if we say anything particularly interesting could happen. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies for enabling the webinar series. For those that don't know, uh, since 2013, the MMU Gothic Centre has been offering postgraduate studies at MA and PhD level. For anyone that's felt inspired by this series or any of the other events uh, and are keen to get more involved with the centre, the Modern and Contemporary Gothic Reading Group will begin on the 1st of June with uh, Carmen Maria Manchado's collection, Her Body and Other Parties. It's, uh, yeah, thank you, Xavi, the link's up there already. Um, it's also worth reminding everyone that Manchester University Press is supporting this series by providing a 30% discount code on all of their texts. Uh, you can find it in the event chat. I think Teresa can put that in now uh, and we'll add it again at the end so uh, it doesn't get buried, uh, what am I saying? buried by all of your questions and comments. And the code is available until June, so it's worth hanging on to if uh, you, know, you never know what might pop up. Speaking of questions, these will be taken at the end of the session and picked up along, by, along the way by our moderator. Or if you're comfortable switching on your camera at the end, you're more than welcome to ask your question yourself. Uh, however, please do write your question in the chat as well, just so we have a record of all of them uh, afterwards, written record. Uh, Gothic Approaches itself is organised by current PhD researchers at MMU, which is myself, Teresa, uh, Teresa Fitzpatrick, who is the moderator, tonight, Alicia Christina Edwards, and both of our speakers for tonight, Kate Maloney and Frederick Blank. With this series, we have aimed to showcase the diversity in Gothic research now underway at Manchester Metropolitan University. And tonight, Kate and Fred will be discussing the eco-Gothic. And eco-horror, I now find, is something different. And so, without further ado, uh, we'll get started with our first speaker. And Kate, you're going first, right? Uh, so... Kate is a PhD student at MMU, as already said. Their research interests centre around the intersection of eco-criticism and speculative fiction, with a specific emphasis on sci-fi, horror, hybridity, and the weird. So uh, take us away when you're ready, Kate. Thanks, Holly. And thank you for justifying my move to uh, eco-horror um, under the umbrella of the eco-gothic. Uh, I am going to share my PowerPoint now and hopefully you should all be able to see it. If you can't, please scream and shout and uh, give me some indication that you can't. Uh, but other than that, uh, I'll get started. So my presentation tonight um, under the auspices of the Eco Gothic is about um, what can we do with the problem of the unthinkable future? And I'm going to be looking at the film Sunshine from 2007 through an eco horror lens to see what it can provide us uh, in terms of a model for um, comprehending the Anthropocene. So my aims are going to be to outline what the cognitive challenge of the Anthropocene is, um, why is it so difficult for us to um, cognitively comprehend. Um, I'm going to propose eco horror and eco gothic in under its uh, broader umbrella as a model for countering the problem of, of unthinkability. And then I'm going to talk at length about Sunshine and how it's a valuable film through which can, to consider what the eco-horrific can offer. So let's talk a bit about the Anthropocene. Um, 
imagining the future in the contemporary moment is fraught, <laughs> to put it mildly. The sustained crisis of climate change, which we'll be using as a broad umbrella term, incorporating the interrelated processes of ocean acidification, uh, pollution, declining biodiversity, uh, deforestation. This is a crisis that has been directly caused by human, most often Western capitalist industrialization. And as a result, the cultural landscape has witnessed a flurry of new lexical and conceptual models aimed at trying to articulate the socio-cultural dialogue into which we are all inexorably mired. This has led to the delineation of our current period as something called the Anthropocene, which is a segment of geological time wherein the multiple impacts of human civilization will be visible in perpetuity through fossil records. The Anthropocene presents a cognitive cha challenge to us as researchers and as people who live within the world um, because it requires an observational perspective that we at present lack. This can be expressed in what I would say is two categories, firstly being the challenge of scale. Um, climate change is in fact climate changes and um, it's multiple interlocking interactive processes and um, Timothy Morton's called this a hyper object where something like uh, radiation has real observable impacts on humanity but which exists and interacts at a scale which forbids us from cognitively or theoretically grasping it um, secondly the challenge of speed uh, we lack as William Gibson noted, a cultural model to depict such a slow apocalypse. Um, one of the ways that the contemporary moment and specifically contemporary cinema is trying to deal with the Anthropocene is through apocalyptic um, cinema and apocalyptic narratives, particularly um, overwhelmingly concerned with the manner and mode of the end times. Um, the threat of environmental calamity is deeply embedded in our social consciousness, even being absorbed and normalized by the institutions of capitalist modernity, to quote Lisa Garforth. Outside the realm of green marketing or decade, uh, individualized responsibility, this can be most clearly observed in the last three decades of apocalyptic cinematic output. Um, we can see a variety of different scenarios. Um, the apocalypse averted scenario, which you can see with the poster of the rather spectacularly dire geostorm, um, is a process of world ending created by human action, prevented by further human action and usually aligned along traditional dichotomies of good versus evil, America versus the rest of the world, etc. It's rarer cousin up at the top with uh, Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, which was 2012, is an apocalypse enacted which usually utilizes a uh, unpreventable planetary disaster. Usually asteroids, don't look up is quite a good example from recently, um, as an opportunity for introspection and reflection on human foibles and fallibilities. And the third one, if we look down at Snowpiercer at the bottom, is the apocalypse endured scenario, where it traditionally focuses on a close family unit within a specific location or a limited cast of characters with the fate of the world if any remains uh, implied rather than portrayed these apocalypse narrative currently fail to um overcome the cognitive challenge of the anthropocene their scale is necessarily limited by geography and particular locations its speed is one informed by instances of dramatic breakdown that is narratively coherent and is resolved in a conclusion the Anthropocene as it is won't happen at the scale in which we can subjectively experience it as a crisis, to quote uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, the um, eco sci-fi writer. Um, and for the theorists like Eugene Thacker, who I've got on the slide here, um, to meaningfully confront the Anthropocene and the unthinkability of the Anthropocene currently is to confront the absolute limit of our ability to adequately understand the world at all. And by overcoming this, we require a model to embrace both the human and the non-human, an integrated model which, I seek to argue, persists at the heart of the eco-horrific mode. So, eco-horror. Um, firstly, to define it, um, I've got a cherry pick list of a few prominent definitions up there from Elizabeth Parker and other um, 
prominent theorists within this area. Um, I've put them together in order to highlight the shared trends and themes across them. Um, the first being the environment or the non-human world as a site of effective response, producing and encouraging states of fear. The environment is inherently frightening. Um, the second is a bit more anthropocentric, concerned with how humanity as a species exists within the world, a relationship which is increasingly troubled and boundaries blurred. That first one, this focus on um, the environment as a site of effective response, is probably more visible in what we might call traditional eco-horror, if you can see if I put my head out the way. Um, this is found kind of, if we were giving it some sort of timeline, we'd have the nature's back uh, reactionary model that arose following the event of the atomic era, quite notably through films like Godzilla, arising a bit more dominantly within um, the 1950s in American cinema and British cinema. Um, these harbour the implication that our hubris, the hubris of mankind, meddles in some sort of established status quo and invites ecological catastrophe. Um, usually we irradiate animals such as in them, which is uh, irradiated giant ants, or beginning of the end, which is irradiated giant crickets, which I guess are scary. Um, in others, such as something like tremors, uh, the status quo has been upset through disturbance in some fashion. Um, and restoration comes through the subjugation of nature and the mastery over the natural world being restored with humanity in its rightful place at the top. The other form, which came off the back of the 1970s and the growing ecological movement, uh, both socially and politically, um, presents didactic parables through the lens of disaster. Um, these are often cautionary tales which deal with um, the issue, the main buzzword issues of the day, such as overpopulation from Ehrlich's book, um, often depicting societal breakdown as a result of pollution or deforestation. And these are found in films like Soylent Green, Doomwatch, uh, Silent Running from 1972. And these would be what is traditional eco-horror, which emphasises had the fear caused by nature and it retains the dichotomy of human versus nature. The problem with this as a model for us in the anthropocentric eco horror, as the quote says, highlights the horror of living in the Anthropocene, but doesn't actually help integrate us into the Anthropocene or offer any sort of solution. Um, this has been more broadly articulated by the critic Simon Estock as uh, ecophobia, um, where the environment is something to be estranged from us and to fear. And I would argue is something that is not going to be as valuable if we're trying to overcome this problem of unthinkability. I seek to argue instead that sunshine, when viewed through an eco horrific lens, um, joins a selection of innovative and complicating approaches to the eco-horrific mode, such as Alex Garland's Annihilation and Junji Ito's Uzumaki, where the ecophobic revenge impulses of traditional eco-horror are complicated by an ecocentric exploration of the human, where boundaries become blurred, the ontology of the human is complicated, and the trans we become a transcorporeal facet of a system which refuses to be articulated fully in anthropocentric terms. So let's talk about Sunshine. Um, Sunshine came out in 2007, so it's, uh, it's, over, it's getting old, getting old. Um, directed by Danny Boyle, uh, it is a sci-fi movie, as you'll be able to tell from the picture, but uh, one that I would argue is a sci-fi horror movie uh, more broadly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to outline a number of trends which I see as integral to this film and this beneficial model of the eco horrific um, and which offer ways of approaching the challenge of the unthinkable. So I'm going to be looking at the depiction of transcendence or what might equally be read as the interaction between the sublime or the numinous 
which through through the film avoids ecophobia and ecophobic dichotomies by implying a complication of that binary. Then I'm going to be looking at the engagement with uh, the concept of transcorporeality and um, the presentation of humanity as a category which is complicated and informed necessarily by involvement with the natural world where the human and non-human become increasingly blurred and my favorite topic as always hybridity where the generic impulses of the text and within the text variously front in order to articulate unthinkability through a multifaceted perspective approach So oh, the plot of Sunshine, just so um, we're all in the same boat. And if anybody hasn't seen it, if you have seen it, I do recommend watching it, but obviously not now. Wait till after this uh, session and then do so. Um, spoilers will obviously be um, in play. Uh, Sunshine, the pulpy disaster premise of something like Armageddon or uh, Deep Impact or The Core. Um, the premise being that the sun is dying with its energy depleting rapidly ahead of an estimate or by billions of years, throwing the globe into a worsening ice age that threatens to extinguish all life on Earth in a total solar winter. Two of the ship, you can see at the top, the Icarus, determinatively named as always, are en route to the centre of the solar system, along with humanity's last hope, a gigantic nuclear bomb, which they hope to use to reignite and to create a star within a star. However, there's always a complication and en route they receive a distress signal from the Icarus ship, who vanished seven years earlier while on the same mission. The previous crew are revealed to have ultimately abandoned this mission, embracing their cosmic insignificance by coming to see Earth's extinction as divinely mandated. The film, which up to this juncture of the story has aligned itself more stylistically with a cinematic language of 2001 A Space Odyssey and an existential pace of something like Tarkovsky's uh, Solaris, takes a hard lean into a uh, body horror slash slasher when Pinbacker, the captain of the Icarus One, attempts to sabotage uh, the mission by you know, offing <laughs> the surviving members of the crew. That is the plot as it stands. So let's talk a little bit about transcendence. Transcendence, as discussed, relates to this problem of unthinkability. The Anthropocene is a representation and articulation and that sunshine allows us an integrated human, non-human perspective without recourse to the ecophobic through its depiction of transcendence. Transcendence, I would argue, is an effective state invoked within quite often science fictional text and um, closely related to what we might describe as a sense of wonder um, a phrase which recurs when discussing science fiction's distinct fantastic media um, and the definition by Jeff Pruker is up at the top isolating the ideas of um, a sensation of awe triggered by an expansion of awareness or a confrontation of the enormity and vastness of our, our reality um, this is a conceptual awakening through a massive paradigm shift in an understanding standing of the world as it is um, compared to as we've known it um, and in this way can be viewed in tandem with theories of the sublime or the numinous which are quite common in the gothic um, as well as broaching more generally into the realms of cosmic horror. Sunshine depicts its transcendence through its recurrent imagery of the huge object in contrast to the enormity of the natural world. I've put a number of pictures up um, this does give the perhaps unfair impression that most of the film is very orange. It's not true, but particularly when the human characters and the human subjects enter the sun as they get closer and closer, it is through this language of vulnerability and smallness where they are on camera and off enveloped by the light. Throughout Sunshine, Characters attempt to conceive the inconceivable. The film opens with the psychologist Searle attempting to view the sun as bright as possible, even though 
to do so for too long would irreparably damage his site. Transcendence then comes at the cost of accessibility. Um, it is impossible to access nature in its true and real form as a human subject, but the attempt is made throughout the film. Throughout the structure of technology and the mediation of technology, the human characters attempt to look upon the sun and come to terms with their place in the universe alongside it. These moments of encounter are characterised by envelopment and musical refrains which blend the orchestral with the synth. Um, it's John Murphy, the um, composer, and Underworld, the um, also composers, but they're they're more specifically related to synth and electronic music, um, combine to produce these heightened moments of soaring euphoria. A limited colour palette, as you can see on the screen, allows the primacy of this moment and the emphasis of its um, overwhelming nature. A simplistic dichotomy of good and bad is subverted, however. The natural world, while a site of beauty, is also a site of threat, unsurvivable to humanity in its raw form without protection. The deaths of three of the main characters at the hands of the element uh, of the element, uh, particularly the element of the sun, are framed in terms of this envelopment. We have um, in the middle down at the bottom, this is the death of Captain Canada as he is taken over by a solar flare. This is the death of um, psychologist Searle as he looks upon the sun and it burns him alive. And the final one is the death of the theoretical physicist Kappa as he finally confronts um, the star, the creation that he has made um, in order to reignite the sun. All of these moments are complicated in that they are framed as moments of peace and alignment in the model of the world. The human is enveloped, but then the human becomes part of the um, system moment only of awe however but also of horror all of these moments even as the orchestral music rises are interspersed with the sound of their visceral reaction to burning alive which is often screaming um or making certain noises of distress i would imagine so to conclude in this point transcendence avoids ecophobia by complicating the encounter with the natural environment there is a medley of anthropocentric perspectives, the uh, the ways in which humans understand nature, but none are given primacy. Ah, it's not moving. Ah, transcorporeality. So, uh, transcorporeality is a theoretical concept, most notably uh, to uh, Stacey Alamiel. And transcorporeality contests that primarily all creatures are intermeshed within a dynamic natural system that crosses through, transforms and is transformed by them. And its aim as a theory is to disrupt Western anthropocentric exceptionalism, denying, as the quote at the top says, the trans historical human agent distinct from the natural world, using examples and advancements in ecology and biology about the porous nature of the human non-human body and the ways in which we are inseparably integrated with the world around us. And one example would be the how the fact that 50% of the body that we understand as human is our genetic material, as in DNA, with the rest being bacterial, microbial or microscopic organisms. We are literally about half, not ourselves which is the most transcorporeal idea <laughs> that exists. What this is useful for, however, in terms of sunshine, is that sunshine explores the transcorporeal entanglement through the film's major conflict between individualism, the human as viewed as a bounded category, and the communal, 
the individual is embodied in characters who consider themselves somehow separate or superior, such as Harvey, the ship's second in command, who places his survival over the survival of all the other crew, and Pinback. We'll talk about in a bit more detail in a bit, who sees himself as somehow chosen or called to make decisions on behalf of humanity. In contrast to the communal impulses of the Icarus 2 crew, who repeatedly prioritise and acknowledge their fleeting nature and transience, describing themselves quite often through the refrain of we are stardust. Um, all the while seeing it as their scientific duty as a species to do the best to avoid distinction. Early on, it, the important position is made that as a group of people, they are called upon to make the most important uh, informed decision available to them under their best knowledge. And this is something that they perpetuate throughout the film. The distinction is made early on about the primacy of communal logic and the survival of species over overt emotionality. In comparison with other sci-fi films such as Event Horizon or Alien, the receipt of the distress signal early on in the film does not instigate on its own an attempted rescue mission. The context of the mission, it is described that even if they had survived, that their lives are utterly replaceable and the lives of the crew are utterly replaceable, instead rendering the mission to the Icarus One in terms of probability, increasing their chance of mission success by having two nuclear bombs rather than one. This logical primacy and challenges to this logical primacy perpetuate throughout the film with emotional responses acknowledged but ultimately not chosen. The first would be whether to save two members of the crew or save the oxygen garden in which they need to complete their journey. The second is whether to save four members of the crew or whether to save one, the one who knows how to work the nuclear bomb. These decisions highlight their acknowledgement and reliance on a, the larger natural system on both the species level and individual level, using the mediation of science to comprehend the human and non-human world. The plot table where humanity utilizes its logical capacity to return fire back to the gods while all the while acknowledging human fallibility that they are doing the best with the knowledge they have but mistakes are inevitably made throughout the film in comparison pinbacker who is established as quite early on almost as an embodiment of the sun he is unable to be looked upon fully the images at the side are these shots that you see at his introduction and the camera deliberately introduces lens glare to make him shrouded in mystery, difficult to comprehend in his totality. In comparison, however, his rationale is one of primacy, possession and supremacy, an individualism which needs to be overcome. He sees himself as the last man, um, as called upon by God, which is how he sees the sun, to allow humanity to come to extinction. But his God is a possessive God in mine, he describes, before trying to kill uh, Kappa. So finally, just to have some quick conclusions, a brief discussion of the generic hybridity of the film. So we've looked at the uh, transcendent nature of it and how that avoids a sense of ecophobia the transcorporeal nature of it, where human reliance and enmeshment into um, the wider environment is acknowledged through transcorporeality. Eco-horror critic Christy Tidwell has argued for a more expansive definition of eco-horror to incorporate impulses towards body horror and cosmic horror, both of which this, which this film possesses. Um, these venial and existential tendencies draw to attention the role of genre in sunshine and in the eco-horrific mode more generally. Generic flexibility, I'd argue, provides the narrative mechanism by which unthinkability can be confronted. The issues of speed and scale addressed at the beginning of the presentation as one of the main challenges of the Anthropocene find themselves responded to in different ways throughout the film as part of different generic impulses. Its science fictional tendency 
affords an expansive overview of the position of humanity as part of a wider cosmos, existentially and physically integrated, if cognitively distinct from the natural world. The dip into slasher horror into the film's third act, in comparison, approaches the same issues of survival and species precarity at the level of the individual through depictions of frenetic enacted violence. So returning to the human non-human model that we sought originally, by considering sunshine through an eco-horrific lens, we can see that it adopts a dual strategy, acknowledging the transcorporeal boundary through its depiction of transcendent experiences and the mechanism and imagery of envelopment, while ultimately confronting the limit of the human capacity of understanding and acknowledging its limitations. Kappa cannot look upon the sun for he'll be blinded, but by the end he does, even though he's visibly, vis visually incapable of comprehending it. Ultimately, it's through the application of their logic, their understanding towards communal betterment and advancement that their mission is able to succeed, offering a model for human non-human advancement that might work us through to the Anthropocene. OK, and that's me. Thank you very much, Kate. Yeah, because lots of applause coming through, e applause coming through already. Brilliant. Uh, without further ado, we'll just crack on to the second one. Uh, remember to put all of your questions in the chat. Um, everything you want to ask Kate afterwards. Uh, so Frederick Blank, who's our next speaker, is a PhD student in English at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University again, where he is currently writing his thesis on the oceanic weird, thalassophobia, and transcorporeality. His thesis explores the materiality of the sea as a weird space and ontology, focusing on sea monsters and hybrids as representational inter intermediaries between human and other than human agencies in the oceanic context. He holds a BA in English and linguistics from the University of Geneva, as well as MAs in English and Gothic studies from the University of L Lausanne, close enough, <laughs> and Manchester Metropolitan University, respectively. His research interests include the weird and the eco-Gothic oceanic tattoo studies and new materialism, and he will be talking to us today about his thesis. Uh, take it away when you're ready, Fred. Thank you, Ollie. So, yeah, so this is, as, as you just said, it will be basically a big chunk of my thesis. So hopefully it will, it will, make, it will make sense. Also, just before we start, I just want to say that um, part of my uh, talk today will be covering the Middle Passage and the history of uh, the slave trade. Um, and I'll try to be as, as respectful uh, as, as it should be, uh, but a little warning there just in case. All right, so uh, in today's talk, I will be discussing the figure of the, the aquatic hybrid, that's why the eco-gothic one itself, in such texts as H.P. Lovecraft's The Shadow of Innsmouth and uh, River Solomon's The Deep, that crystallizes eco-gothic discourses and anxieties surrounding the human interrelationship with the ocean. Both texts articulate in varying ways a particular form of the weird, that of the oceanic weird. In doing so, my aim is to articulate within the oceanic weird the movement towards a particular ontology and affect of a body aquatic, a kind of fallacy feeling, if you will, that in part delineates a transcorporeal interconnective and becoming with a submersion and the undersea experience comes to highlight. Literature and culture are replete with representations of creatures that embody the crucial liminality uh, between land and water, between the, the human and the non-human in the guise of half human, half fish beings or monsters. Lowfolks, Salkis, and other sea monsters populate our imaginations and in part, as we shall see, come to exemplify both the unknowable and the unnerving other of the deep blue sea with its corresponding fears of devolution and atavism, as well as the radical potentialities of posthuman futures. Through the semantic field of the sludge and the slime, the shadow of Innsmouth constructs oceanic ecologies within the logic of dread and revulsion. This first wave, as it were, of oceanic weird reifies the sea as a space of horror and dread where the unnerving and disruptive qualities of the sea are mirrored by the monstrous physicality of the creatures that dwell in the surface and indeed by the seemingly alien contours of its flora and vegetation. It deploys a deep organicity that situates in the ocean the repulsive qualities of the bodily, the gloopy totality of the tentacle and the liquid mobility of the ooze and slime. This discourse, in other words, is that of the thalassophobic, a subset of, East, uh, of 
Simon C. S. Stock's ecophobia, summarized by Sean Harrington as a, quote, phobic response to sea and deep open water, unquote, which in turn produces the feeling of oceanic horror or a, quote, terror that comes from the discord between the reflective surface and the depths beneath that draws our gaze into dark places from which we may never return, unquote. The deep, on the other hand, as we shall see, uh, a guy is the St. River Solomon's the deep, on the other hand, constitutes a new wave of oceanic weird, a new oceanic wave, and it constructs the ocean as a material space of tragic memory, as well as possible potentialities for the crucially nonlinear temporality, or the merfolk or mermaids inhabiting these steps are descendants of the dead of the Middle Passage. Um, we know on the ecographic, the recent resurgence of interest in H.P. Lovecraft's weird fiction and the weird in general starkly coincides with the increasing consequences of climate change. At a point in history where the snowballing effects of industrialization, greenhouse emissions, and rising sea levels appear as veritable counterpoints, counterpoints to such concepts as the Anthropocene, which understands, as we've seen with Kate, um, not only our current ge ge geological era as one large influence in determining that humanity's whole of the environment hold in question. Um, while it is overwhelmingly clear that humanity has caused these env environmental upheavals, as we can see every day, it is becoming increasingly clear to that so called nature is retaliating, in a sense, striking back in unprecedented and unnerving ways. If, as Carl H. said of all, and Andrew Weinstein explaining the age of Lovecraft, Lovecraft's unprecedented growth in popularity is due to the ways in which he, had, he quotes, addresses, questions, anxieties, and quote, desires that have become increasingly insistent, unquote, in the recent years, then one of these concerns is indubitably that of humanity's fraught relationship with the other agency of nature. Material equal critics, such as uh, Sopo Opperman and Serena, Serenella Jovino, argue that, the, the, quote, the world's material phenomena are not in a vast network of agencies, unquote. Where a personal agencies, such as of hurricanes, primeval forests, and the Gulf Stream, for example, all have a hand in shaping through the interplay, the very environment of which humanity is a part. Lovecraft's weird depictions of active vegetation, of, of encroaching forests, and indeed of oceans, uh, are replete with non-human monstrosities particip that participate in the articulation of such agencies. Appreciably elaborating on so-called anthropocentric crises, as Gray Olstein remarks, that quote model the preconceived role division between actor and actor upon. That is, such traditional backdrops of horror as the seas in this case are not content to remain mere settings, but come alive. The terrible agencies make clear and weirded as ecological monsters in themselves. That sort of illustrates what Timothy Morton's uh, talk in the sense of the ecolo ecological awareness being weird. As in, as he says, twisted looping form, which entangles together the human and other than human. The weird, um, much like the gothic or horror, is a literature of excess, uh, and I should say even more so in the sense that its affective excesses um, are that of the ooze and the slime, the slobbering organicity of the mold and the fungus and the seaweed. Uh, in other contents. Monsters of the weird ooze and dribble with goo with its strange contaminations and contamination of the animal, vegetal, and the fungal. If the gothic is a multiplicity, then the weird is profoundly rhizomatic. We'll come back, hopefully, if we have time to rhizome. Uh, a contagious proliferation that, like a mushroom or indeed seaweed appears similarly from memory and fundamentally disturbs boundaries and perspective. Such an organicity crucially resonates with the ocean as an eco-gothic space whose materiality largely speaks to us of the sublime and the unnerving. Um, a quick note on, on what I term, as I said, as a thalassic feeling. I, I borrow from Freud's idea, frustrated idea of the ocean, oceanic feeling to describe uh, this sense, uh, as Roman Roland says in, in Freud, um, this quote, feeling of an indissoluble bond, a bond of being one in the external world as a whole that is oceanic. Uh, this feeling of interconnectivity with the, with the world at large, uh, equated with the immensity and fluidity of the ocean, serves for me as a connective link between the undersea and an effective response to its particular contours in contradictory distinction, that of land. Uh, so from philosophobia and a sense of philosophia, as we shall see, I try and construct this idea of a philosophic feeling. Uh, but I turn my attention to um, uh, to numerous articulations of the ocean as a particular inspiring example of 
transferable reality, as, as Kate mentioned before, Stacey Zalimo's transferable reality of the human, as she says, quote, substantially and perpetually interconnected with the flows of substances and the agencies of an environment. And thus, I will engage with both the shadow and smith and hopefully the deep, as we have time, as ecographic tales that taken together sketch the contours of a flaccid feeling, an affect of both fear and wonder at an emergency. So, uh, going to the shadow of the rainsmith. Uh, the shadow of the rainsmith uh, is a tale of a young man unnamed in text, uh, but mentions that one Robert Olmsted in Lovecraft's notes to the novella. He travels across New England and discovers a new, nearby existence of the small, decrepit town of Ainsmith on the Atlantic to uh, coast. The town he learns is an isolated community, apparently secluded within a coastal landscape of, quote, wide salt marshes, desolate and unpeopled on, on the one side, and a boundless, boundless Atlantic Ocean on the other. What he discovers in the horror as he explores the rundown and dilapidated town is a population of fish frog hybrids emerging from the seashore. The town's inhabitants, he learns, have intermingled with deep ones, an immortal species of fish like huma humanoids from across the ocean and in the waters. When old enough, they will travel into the sea to join their ancestors in the cities of the deep ones. Robert Olmsted's initially appalled at discovery escapes in the dead of night. In the, in the final twist of the novella, Olmsted himself later discovers that he is, in fact, by way of one of his cousins, a, a, um, part of the Innsmouthians himself, and bound also to join them underneath the waves, thereby embracing his own hybridity and, quote, acquiring what he calls the Innsmouth look. The, this society town of uh, Innsmouth is in, inextricably bound up with its many point of contact with water, with the ocean, be they the, 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 the sea, the coast, the rivers, or the marshlands that surround the town on all sides. These aquatic spaces construct an intricate hybrid geography that once reifies the oceanic as a space of horror and monstrosity at the same time that it suggests its fundamental appeal and capacity to elicit wonder and fascination. In this way, this coastal geography mirrors in its concatenation the metamorphic qualities of the ones and its moving siblings. One of the epicenters of this tension between horror and wonder is the site of the Devil's Reef. It's standing beyond the town's harbor, the reef functions as a nexus which connects the different Gothic and weird elements in the narrative as well as to the sublime, so often related to the sea. Looking at it for the first time as he traveled to Innsmouth, Armstrong describes it as a, quote, long black line, scarcely rising above the water, yet carrying a suggestion of a latent malignancy, unquote. This feeling of the reef's malignancy is complicated by a different one, that of a, quote, subtle, curious sense of beckoning, which seems superadded to grim repulsion, unquote. These contrary feelings of disgust and attraction, which intrinsically will prove themselves as a result of the narrative's own complex relationship to the sea. Underscore and intricate ecographic construction of the ocean is a space at once dangerous and enchanting, where the reef and the seas all around it themselves carry a threat of invasion akin to that of the point's monstrous bodies, foreshadowing the thoughts of the feelings of dread and horror that the latter bursting forth from the foaming waves come to embody. Returning to Stacey's Alamo's use of concept of transcorporality, I situate the hybridity of the grotesque Innsmouthians within a larger context of ontological interplay between the human and the other than human and the ocean's edge. Alamo understands, quote, moving across bodies, unquote, as a key element of her conceptualization. She contends that such an underlying thread, quote, opens up a mobile space that acknowledges the often unpredictable and unwanted actions of human bodies, non human creatures, ecological systems, chemical agents and other actors, unquote. This emphasis on the unpredictability and often confrontational nature of movements between and across bodies resonates with the central tensions of the world in novella. That is, it proposes a framework through which we can examine the fear of hybridity and miscegenation that the, that the shadows of Innsmouth situates at the coast and in the ocean alongside the undercurrents of alluring fascination that such a hybridity also ends to provoking. Others consider the denizens of Innsmouth in light of their particular relationship to water not only in terms of their physicality, but of their own hydrosocial experience of life. One that goes beyond the monstrous and examines the novel's ambivalent characterization of an object yet alluring and ultimately embraced aquatic ontology. The narrative, narrative in its construction of the seaside town of Innsmouth as a place of decay and unnerving transformation concerns itself with the intertwining of bodies and geography, while the crumbling and haunting town invaded by water mirrors the inhabitants and narrators' bodies, themselves haunted by the ever encroaching sea. The latter becomes a contested site of hybridity and metamorphosis. In an instrument in this regard is a haunting space where the very shadow that is found draped over its building inhabitants underlines the consequences of the past and its lingering 
after effects on the present as well as the future. The coast in keeping with the waves are forever coming break on the shoreline, threatening to invade and inundate before receding into the sea once more. Uh, to speak of a haunting in this case is to situate the town within the context of its demise and decay, where simple report simple reports onto any ruin is in tight building in one's words. Jimmy Packham, in terms of argue that the quote the coastal landscape is one of competing traditions in which the palimpsestic layers of history remains visible, where a plurality of historical times and cultural practices exist in successive layers without ever quite overwriting one another. Unquote. The concept of a palimpsest here absolutely describes a salient layering of geography and ontology that Innsmouth represents. The narrative makes clear the sense of layering of different epochs, states, as well as physicality that seems to coalesce around Innsmouth and its inhabitants, while a succession of events that, that led to its liberation can be clearly appreciated at the same time as a concatenated, concatenated temporality of the Innsmouthian's transformation reinforces with the palimpsestic nature of the seaside town. <laughs> The idea of a haunting more of a brings to the fore what, what some have understood as the ontological nature of the oceanic, where well, the past forever returns and embedded in the present. Um, David Ponter, for example, suggests that the philosophic independence of our relationship to the sea can be, as a, can be seen as a quote, cardinal example of the conflation, the inseparability of the weird and the ontological, unquote. Indeed, Ponter draws attention to the double nature of the oceanic monster, as I hear argues that, quote, for all the what might emerge dripping and incomprehensible incomprehensibly gesticulating at low tide might appear to be the totally other. It might also have the contours of a half recognizable self and thus relate to the theory revenant. Unquote. The assertions, um, indeed, the deep ones bridging the ontological gap between land and sea embody a form of haunting where the aquatic mass of the human becomes superimposed onto its presence. In this case, as in others, interestingly, haunting is an inescapably felt and embodied experience. For as Susan Hayahawk argues, it is something that is fluid and appearance by and through the body. Katie Shaw too highlights how the ontological as an understanding of the layering of past, present, and future collapses temporality. Um, the spectra, she argues, quotes, dissolves the separation between now and then, as it also marks a point at which multiple temporalities meet and cross. Unquote. In this uh, regard, Intimuth is understood as a perpetually haunting presence, a spatial spectral materiality, forever revisited by the spectres of its more glorious industrial past. The Innsmouthians too are haunted. Their bodies, as is for us all transformation narratives, become a literalized sense of contention, a haunted space between spectres of the past and future. In the monstrous bodies, all temporality collapses as a slow transformation of the young and human looking gives way to the excessively aquatic nature of the old. Um, moreover, they are haunted in hybrid qualities coalesce within a framework of degeneration and misgeneration that reifies a set of philosophical distorses that locate within the sea as mutable liminality. The anxiety is pertaining to the dislocation of the mankind's stable self. Indeed, the philosophobia in Lovecraft's novella unveils the oceanic as fundamentally disabilizing. Compounders of temporality, speciality, as well as body integrity are all increasingly shattered as the discovery of the metamorphic qualities of deep ones and their descendants destroys any possibility of the tra traditional, stable, white Anglo American self. Beyond the outer layer of repulsion, the fear of degeneration, of degenerative misgeneration, so associated with Lovecraft's writing, like a definite articulation of the interstitial nature of humanity. Sophus A. Reiner, uh, Reinert rightly argues that Lovecraft's racist anxieties are centered around his quote, understanding of a preoccupation with atavism, of evolutionary throwbacks, survivals, and regression in modern industrial society. Unquote. The final sec in the early 20th century saw the rise of evolutionary theories that were promptly co opted by social and right. Racial discourse, as we can see there. Um, Charles Darwin alluded to the oceanic parts of all mammals, including humans, noting that they are, quote, probably derived from the ancient marsupial animal uh, with amphibian like or fish like um, characteristics. Fears that human kind may revert back to a, to a more primitive past, located within, within so called non, non, non white populations, alleged. Activistic characteristic that might spread to white Western society if intermarrying was encouraged or condoned. Visions of an aquatic evolutionary past tend to evoke fears of an unstable lineage, a tottering tree of life that could easily be stayed by. It is no surprise, therefore, that Lovecraft would locate his tale of racial degeneration within the locus of the ocean. The deep one's grotesque liminality reveals the instability of the boundaries between humans and non humans. The prism of the weird here only heightens this insecurity, whereas Ponto muses 
quote, perhaps we do not always accept that the avian the monstrous is far from the side effect of our humanizing categories, but rather underlines, underlies them, quote. In other words, the seemingly monstrous shapes of the inhabitants of Innsmouth and the challenge of Western civil boundaries participate in this perpetual redrawing since by their hybrid nature, they simplify the very process of objection that create them, thereby exposing specifically classophobic tendencies and anxieties, as well as racist ones, especially in the case of Lovecraft. Um, Oli, how am I doing for time? You've uh, got about seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay, I'll do where I can. Thank you. Um, now I go to a slightly shorter version of, of talking about the deep, the river Solomon, the deep. Um, so in contrast, in having contrast with the fear and the, the this sense of philosophic um, understanding of, of devolution and activism in Lovecraft, um, the river Solomon is the deep is an a, a evocative example of new oceanic weird discourses, which instead of reifying the aquatic hybrid as subhuman, bestial, other, um, whose monstrosity, monstrosity party serves to underline racist and white supremacist fantasies, celebrate such inflations of land and water physicalities as a means of exploring posthuman potentialities as well as negotiating the complicated consequences of climate change and the Anthropocene and in my, the world. <clears throat> The Deep, as we shall see, is a formidable example of what Stephanie T. Dunning calls quote the, quote, the Black Weird, where traditional weird tropes find new purchase as evocations of the horrors of white hegemony and violence perpetrated upon individuals of color. The Black Weird, uh, Dunning argues, quote, represents a rich textual exploration into violation and absurdity of white racism as experienced from within a Black worldview, unquote. The Deep, illustrates black weird consideration as it subverts ocean weird tropes in order to articulate the horrors of the middle passage where quote whiteness bears the signs of the uncanny and the weird seeps through these forces of trauma in and under the water um the deep is a story of black subjecti subjectivities being remade within the oceans at best in his politics of the relation the philosopher and poet Edouard Glissant Pointingly describes the sea within the hard context of the Noble Passage and the African slave, slave trade as a space which comes to signify an ontological shift, a temporal and spatial dislocation separating the men, women, and children adopted from Africa from their home history and therefore their identity. The sea within this context separates as well as it amalgamates. It obliterates history, but in the space of material and effective dissolution, as much as it becomes a site of memory, lost in commemoration. It, sign it signals a crucial shift between the forgotten stolen past and the approved present. As Glissant crucially explains, quote, the entire ocean makes one vast beginning, but a beginning whose time is marked by these balls and chains gone green. Uh, in the case of the Middle Passage, River Solomon's The Deep remains within the abyss and reimagines the space of ultimate trauma through the hybrid bodies of the, Waj the Wajir, uh, Wajinra, a siren like posthuman species birthed from the pregnant women uh, who were thrown overboard the slave ships. The ocean in Solomon's novella becomes a space of revitalized agency and emancipa emancipatory power, whose transportal materialities from sort of vision of the sea as a powerful multi layered signifier of utopian possibility. The Wajin will come to exemplify the ability and prevailing capacity of the ocean to represent both colonial power and native resistance, as Bernard Klein and Gessa Mackenton note how the ocean has historically functioned as called a site of loss, dispersal, and enforced migration, but also, as a, also of new forms of solidarity and affective kinship. Unquote. Indeed, through the Wajiru, it is the whole history of the Middle Passage that is reclaimed and reinvented within a deep world of underwater pressures and internal ecologies, liberated from oppressive colonial apparatuses and operating a capital balance to capitalist, with capitalist ventures, which endanger and establish the biodiversity uh, and ecological balance. Uh, so almost another that takes place deep underwater in what is implied to be somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. It follows the character of Ye Yetu, one of the Wajiru, and a historian whose particular function within a underwater society is to gather and recall all the memories of the common and traumatic past, as well as that of her predecessors through the six centuries that seem to separate her from their harrowing beginning as a progenitors of drowned bond people. This is not an easy task, however, as the heightened sensitivity to the world around her makes her position as a living archive one of constant, constant suffering. Um, The burden of her people's memories weighs down on her such that she finds herself in it herself, increasingly dissolving the wellspring of the memories or remembrance she carries. 
finding herself adrift in memory that wasn't hers, uh, always being drawn back, um, back into the intensive memories. So Ramon's um, point in the novella following the creative utopian combination of artists such as Gretzia, clipping radically alters and reimagining the national figure of Merfolk or the mermaid. Uh, the hybridity of the imaginary is one that amalgamates and crystallizes into the body of Merfolk, the meaning dichotomies and the positions that, con that contact zone between land and ocean, past and present, memory and erasure comes to emphasize. The novel harnesses the traditional trope of the Merfolk to poignantly literalize the dislocation and transformation that that the Middle Passage produced through the violence, spoliation, and enslavement of African peoples by European mercantile and colonial powers. Uh, the Wajinger in the ambiguous liminality with an equally fluid ecotone that she represents makes us veer into an ocean weird we cannot completely fathom. It's a series of oceanic temporalities that confuse our own set of linear, uh, linearity. Um, is, uh, that you know, because I'm almost on, I'm, 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 I'm getting a bit over boy, literally. Uh, but there's a sense of uh, the oceanic, tem oceanic, I said for oceanic and temporalities, where you got the the, the linear temporality of the colonial uh, and mercantile ve uh, ventures, where the sea is seen as uh, atemporal or the same liquid immensity devoid of both history and the very time that would underscore it. Uh, which makes it a ready-made wild space for colonial and capitalist ventures. Virgin waters, as it is, mirroring the American's frontier, virgin lands are empty and thus ready to be used and indeed abused. Um, so the, in, within this sort of colonial system of white Western hegemony, the this, sea this is seen as a space to be traversed, tamed and conquered. Whereas on the other hand, Ocean varieties of the, for the oppressed, colonized, and dispossessed are overflowing, overflowing with the weight of history, constructing the ocean as a full of bodies, the drowned and the enslaved. Um, the Atlantic Ocean, in particular, is one of the main theaters of the slave trade. It is quote understood as an unmarked gravesite, unquote, and thus an important space and agent within quote the enduring focal point of diasporic, diasporic cultural memory. The passage constitutes as um, Delo as Delofri and the game argues. Uh, the ocean from this perspective is more than a flat space through which mercantile ships navigate, and whose temporality is only marked by the rising of the tides and the groaning of the ship's crew. Rather, it overflows with fantastic again, accretion of the dead on the one hand, and the complexity of its materialities, both human and non-human. Its temporality is far from being unique and inert, become multiple and unstable. In the Caribbean, especially where the suffering incurred through death and displacement makes itself particularly known, um, Delofre argues again that the discourse of oceanic submersion articulates a submarine temporality in which linear models of time are distorted and ruptured, the product of the violence of transatlantic colonial history as well as an immersion in the maturity of the ocean itself. Thinking in the ocean terms, therefore, opens us to an understanding of time that is multi layered and messy, often confusing and contradictory. Cecilia Lemo again brings attention to these idiosyncratic qualities of oceanic time, advising us to Called think of the pelagic abyssal seas as zones that compress, transform, and more or render periodical the scales of time and distance. Unquote. Oceanic time, indeed, within the context of the Middle Passage, cannot be reduced to a simple linearity of a colonial time, measured and controlled by the white, by white Western enterprise, one which in turn hollows out at once the complex interconnections of non human nature, see, and the hiring depredation committed on in no ways. I think I'm, I think I'm going to have to um, start to. Uh, uh, wind up to a conclusion, uh, but the, the sense of the the one the one general in uh, the deep sort of um, put together a sense of of multi layer temporalities uh, that uh, in in this in in their own hybrid body um, merge in temporalities in the sense of of the ocean of the oceanic uh, within them they. For the uh, function as a sort of metonymic idea as your hybrid body of the oceanic and the sense. And um, in the end, the novel asks us to think in terms of the, or in, in the oceanic term, that is in a non linear and forward way, which allows us to give the many temporalities that unfold in the depths. Um, It's 
present the novella presents the the this perpetual double space the, the of um, being at the same time past present and future within within this uh, the hybrid body of the web genre. I am conscious of time, so I will uh, conclude that. What I try to see to, to, to show during during this overwhelming talk is the idea of of thalassophobia and thalassophilia being merging within this sort of the thalassic feeling within the ocean, a sense of a particular way of being and becoming at sea through the hybrid body, uh, one that also shows um, for an eco gothic perspective or interrelationship with the ocean. Uh, and thank you very much. I will stop there. Thank you, thank you very much, Fred. A uh, rapid fire paper. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. And uh, let yeah, any questions anybody's got for Kate or Fred on what you've just heard, stick them in the chat. Yeah, it's good to have you back on, Kate. Um, we're going to start off with Zabby's questions, seeing as he was uh, first in there. Uh, question for both of you. Uh, both of you have made reference to ecological uh, new materialism. What do you see, Zabby wants to know, what do you see as the, this approach's main benefits or critical insights? Uh, or simply, uh, what do you find? Why do you find it useful? Uh, I guess maybe we'll give Fred a break first. <laughs> hey. I wanted Fred to go first because new material is his baby, but I, you know, it's all right, don't worry. The rest, get a drink of water, Fred. Um, I think one of the useful things about uh, especially ecological new materialism is I think any model for working through contemporary literature or cinema within the sort of Anthropocene era, I think it has to offer some way of thinking through. Um, I know Donna Haraway's got the staying with the trouble and she believes that thinking through the Anthropocene is by thinking through the the chthonic nature, I think, of uh, Yeah, I, it's I, a problematic I, I issue. I don't entirely agree with that, I'll be entirely honest, but I think it does attach onto something that is we're trying to find language to describe something that has never been describable in the context of sort of Western society. And there's quite a lot of good research on how these states of world ending have repeatedly occurred in uh, sort of indigenous communities. Um, but that that's having to now be translated in sort of to Western models of uh, we're panicking. How do we discuss how we're panicking and how do we get through it? Um, so I think new materialism isn't the only way to think through it, but is definitely one of the ways that we can get over ourselves as a species. Interesting point, Fred. You got anything to chime in on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I I'm quite opportunistic when it comes to new materialism, uh, but I I I I think that for me. Uh, it's this sense of being interconnected, uh, that this sort of vi not vitalist, but this, but this this idea of um, just for me the the gothic in general, but the weird especially is such an organic. Um, it's it, the monsters and the creatures and and the sense of self within weird fiction is so organic, so gloopy, so um, full of stuff and thing. Uh, that it really shows this of the the, um, the states of the perpetual sense of becoming, states of of interconnectedness between uh, everything in, in a sense. Uh, so I, new materialism has has its problems. I think sometimes there's a sense of where does agency, a personal agency, start and where does it end, and it's a bit sometimes a bit too Gaia. Uh, Gaia Gaia um, for me, but it's it's very much this sense of the transcorporeal idea of a label, for example, uh, in the sense of networks that I find interesting. I think that's quite a nice comment to to sort of on the back of that, Fred, is that I think one of the main, w in terms of the cognitive challenges of the Anthropocene, one of the challenges is that it is just a series of escalating feedback loops where one thing begets another thing, begets another thing, and that we are we struggle to predict what those feedback loops are going to be because they manifest so drastically not in the same place or in the same time as the first thing the first domino that whacked so i think new materialism gets that idea of 
everything's connected but I, I I do agree with Fred in that it can sometimes be a bit um imprecise in terms of new materialism I think there are times where the question the blurring of the boundary between non-human and human doesn't actually matter and what is mattering is how a text is constructing humanity and what they do with that is more important than where does the human end and the non-human begin which can be a bit overwrought for me it's a starting point yeah it's, yeah it's it is a very really much starting a starting point, point. um yeah but uh, yeah, it's big questions that were raised by the first question. I was I was going to chime in with one that's even worse, to be honest. Uh, this is another one for both of yours. Uh, while we're waiting for any other questions in the chat, Teresa's put one in for afterwards. Um, it seems that both of the texts, uh, well, all the texts that you were talking about here, to some extent, extent speak to the limitations of agency. Uh, either humankind, a particular socioeconomic group, in uh, Fred's case particularly, uh, or the individual, or in fact all of them. Uh, obviously this is quite a timely theme in 2022 with the uh, discussion around the efficacy of climate activism and uh, climate hopelessness particularly. Um, and you know the sort of uh, the related issue of like the global loss of faith in political institutions uh, outlined by uh, Peter Mayer uh, Ashley Laval and 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 uh, among others. Uh, could you each talk a little bit about how your research engages with this idea of empowerment or disempowerment, uh, and what this tells us about the attitudes of uh, contemporary audiences to uh, to these crises? Either can go first, or tell me to go away. I, yeah, I, I so. There was a lot in this question. Uh, <laughs> what, I, what I can say when it comes to, to what, I'm, the, what I'm looking at, um, the, the, the new weird, a strand of new weird, especially a strand of the ocean new weird, uh, is very much a rewriting of um, just of Lovecrafting elements through a, a different perspective, the perspective of, of um people of color of um by uh, of women or of uh, members of the lgbtq plus community uh, that are using those tropes uh, to go to to reverse the the sort of horrible racism and, and colonialism uh that is in lovecraft but also in, in, in william hope hobson uh and other men also write all the works of the weird uh, in this case, you, I mean, you got the deep period, obviously, and I'm very sorry that I had to cut short because I've got I had so much more to say. But and I'm just really sorry. It's in, like anyway, so that there's also uh, Rita and Diana's uh, tentacle that I'm reading through. Uh, there's this there's, there's um, Enedi Okorafor's uh, Lagoon. There's there's a, there's a, a strand of um, uh, of of people using the oceanic weird to talk about. Uh, issue, issues, uh, postal, uh, colonial and postcolonial issues, um, and that's where I think it's very interesting uh, because there's a sense of the weird gives this sense of, on the one hand, a very over-encompassing hyper object like um, uh, enemy in a sense, but an adversarial entity that, that is shown this like, and on the other hand, its capacity for um, metamorphic qualities of the ocean and the weird is where I am and that's why. Yeah, wonderful. I was going to bring up the new weird in a bit, so I'm glad you did it for me. Uh, Kate, you got anything to say on futility, agency, empowerment? Oh, 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 all the guys in the gang, all those. Uh, uh, yeah, my, I mean, my research is slightly different from Fred's and that I speak a bit more to um, sort of the science fictional and how science fiction um, is involved with a lot of other generic tendencies in order to articulate the fact that the modern world is terrifying. Um, but I think one of the things about agency that comes up in quite a lot of text is that it, agency becomes acknowledged um, and the form of that agency, but that it's never viewed as an excuse not to do anything. Um, passivity is always re registered as a negative. Um, I'm trying to think most of my stuff is on space horror but something like um moon there is the economic um 
lack of agency, the per the lack of agency within this sort of man who is an objectified, reified, perfect worker because he's a clone. Cloning quite often deals with this sort of identity crisis about what a person is and what a person can do. And ultimately, if it's something like uh, Mio Lafferty's Six Wakes looks at this quite nicely as well. Um, ultimately, the conclusion is you got to do the best you can within the system you have. You cannot know the um, the risk, how your actions necessarily will improve things, but it is the responsibility to seek to acquire change wherever it is potential. Yeah, that's a fascinating idea. Bring it down. It's my conclusion. <laughs> Bring it all down. Eat the rich. Uh, <laughs> you heard it here. Definitely not first. Uh, so we'll go to, I guess, Teresa's asked two questions now, so we, we'll give her a shot. Uh, Fred, you mentioned kinships in passing during your paper. Based on that idea of interconnectedness, could you say a bit more about oceanic kinships? That's a big one, which is a... Um... So again, the example of the deep, where um, you've got this this fabulated um, um, species, possible species uh, of mermaids, uh, that that um, not only have to wrestle with uh, with the trauma of their past, but doing so, it's, it's doing so. Uh, it's also about reimagining a different way of being. Uh, than the than the one, the land based one, so this is an oceanic uh, posthuman future. Uh, to say in the, in the book, for example, uh, there, it's also a, a a species that is um, uh, that is hermaphrodite, for example. Uh, the kinship there is is in this context um, is the idea of, of making kin with the environment, with the ocean in a different ways, in that way of uh, that goes on the one hand against a sort of heteronormative um, um, uh, idea on the one hand. Now, second, there's an example in the book where the, they talk about first mothers and second mothers, and uh, first mothers being uh, the, 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 the women that drown, but the second mothers being, the, being whales that um, uh, took those, the, those, uh, those young within uh, um uh in helping and fed them uh, so the, it's a, the sense of making king with the environment this is very this is very new material uh, idea uh gaia uh but in this context is the sense of seeing the interrelationship within a different environment that the, the language within a more fluid more mutable um environment we can imagine different ways of being is, is what authors like River Solomon is doing. I hope this makes sense to a degree. Yeah, certainly. Uh, yeah, that's a fascinating idea. Um, yeah, we'll go to, oh, Victoria's per question in for Kate, that's helpful. Uh, obviously one of Eco Horror's main critiques of humanity is constantly seeing the natural world as a sort of endless plastic resource. Uh, you could argue that sunshine is the ultimate example of this. The sun itself is a resource that can be manipulated by humankind, albeit one that demands the sacrifice of a few humans. How do you feel the movie balances these ideas? I'm so glad someone asked that. Um, it's one of my favourite things about the film is that it's so confused about it and it, it, it really does try and articulate this sense of sort of ecocentrism and the primacy of the environment but it is ultimately completely bounded within an anthropocentric worldview it is the the premise of the film is that humanity has the scientific capacity to perpetuate our lifespan even though the sun is dying it's never explained why it's so rapidly ahead of schedule than it should have been but it's not actually through any natural catastrophe in terms of something going off course it the sun is coming to the end of its natural cycle and the premise of the film is that we as a species have decided it's probably better it doesn't and we just we just keep it going um so i think it's absolutely fascinating because the film spends so much time 
arguing between the antagonist whether it's humanity's right to choose that and at the end it doesn't really come down on either side um but i do think that because of the way the film um sort of frames the antagonist pinbacker who sees that he sees the sun as this external thing this god that has called upon him to you know rain fire and judgment down um upon those that would seek to abandon uh, the status quo um that's shown as equally as anthropocentric and individualistic he's not speaking for the sun he's speaking for himself so i think the film really tries with the anthropocentric perspective it has to balance that out but equally there is the massive question and i don't think quite in my research i've got to i've got an answer solid answer for you but there is the argument that yeah if if we're saying it's a reverse prometheus story we're casting ourselves in a superior position as the bestowers and the givers of life so how can that be ecocentric and it's a good question and i think if you give me 18 months i'll have an answer for you Hell yeah it makes me think a little bit of because i haven't seen i still haven't seen sunshine oh, uh, God. shock horror but I, it makes me think of lovecraft's t and barlow's uh till all the seals till all the seas right i think i don't know if you read that one kate it's basically like the humanity dying as the as the, the sun finally like sort of dies millions of years from now it's just just sort of like breathe it's just prissy of how civilization is, is going down and, and the last human dies and falling into a well i think it's absolutely like, so. fascinating that apocalyptic narratives even though they're about the extinction of all life on earth ultimately become a pity party about the loss of humanity and how we're all going to go and you know what will happen to us like all of the seeking a friend for the end of the world but also like don't look up they're all very insular they're all about the fleetingness and fragility and transcendence of human existence in the context of everything that's about to end but i don't think most of them quite capture the enormity of that ending it's much more of a personal self-centered mm -hmm. conclusion to existence i guess i think it's just sense of you when when one thinks that we are the sort of like the 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 witness to mm -hmm. the universe whether it's true or not it's this sense of what happens to the witness like what happens to the universe when there's no one presumably to witness it uh and we think we feel ourselves as the witness mm. which you could make a very good uh comparison between this sort of ethereal apocalypticness of uh of sunshine versus the like i guess materiality commercialism of don't look up how exactly yeah. as you say just this this complete um i don't know allergic reaction to the profound to uh bring <laughs> it down to it's so fed up throughout i'm thinking of that meal at the end of the film where they just sat around at a table all discussing their favorite products and i'm like is this an advert <laughs> it got very strange native advertising um, but anyway the, um is it deep impact where there's the asteroid collision mm -hmm. yeah it's deep impact and there's a scene on the beach where um the the film doesn't have an entirely enacted apocalypse in that the world doesn't entirely die but the entire i guess emotional crux of the asteroid hitting is this woman reconciling with her estranged father on the beach as they wait for the end to come and it's a really quite a, a cinematically emotive moment but it does again beg victoria's question as whether you can have a discussion outside of anthropocentrism while being bound and trapped within the anthropocentric perspective for eternity i think i think the short answer is you can't can you really step out of your shoes of our shoes uh to do that until we can communicate with the octopi probably not all the mushrooms apparently all I, the there's mushrooms a new, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, no there's a, a there's a new uh there's a new research in the uk somewhere i forget what oh. university but it's of about the fact that basically uh mushrooms have language in a sense uh apparently no sense that they um mushrooms communicate by using specific words within a sort of electro electro impulses uh and there's they, they found like a number of words and almost dialects between different species 
very very weird. But that that exactly that is the sort of thing that new machine list will be talking now for years. Absolutely. That's oh, the sort of research the they want. So in the earth, shout out to in the earth if anyone hasn't seen it. That is a that is an eco eco gothic extravaganza of mushrooms and every shear smith running yeah. around a forest looking deranged. Yeah, like Mexican Gothic, as 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 Xavier was just saying. <laughs> three shears, it's not yeah. Mexican Gothic, but it could do with three shears, Smith. In the Earth. Is it in the, in the Earth? The um. What's uh, what's that again? Oh, who's the director? He he directed Kill List and. I forget if I've seen this or not. You you you'll have remembered it. It's a bunch of it's a bunch I of people in the pandemic going to a forest. The mushrooms. Ben Wheatley. Oh, Jenna, you gave. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I haven't ben seen Wheatley. it. Yeah, it's I, I need to see it, but I haven't seen it yet. There we go. Fabulous. Yeah, no, I need to see um, yes, I need to see it. Mushroom, yeah. mushroom horror, mushroom gothic. Bringing it back to the papers, Thanks. though, for one last question, I guess. Um, I was going to say. Well, I, I started with the question, really, didn't I? What was the most recent e eco-gothic text you were impressed by that maybe did something innovative or shocking? I guess this actually ties into uh, what Victoria was saying, um, the the attempt at thinking beyond, um, I guess, the human thought. Uh, what was the most interesting recent example that you've encountered? Okay. You, you, um, I, I've got, I've got one. <laughs> I've got one. If, uh, Go for it. You think so? I Sea Fever, uh, the Irish film from 2020, I think 2021. Uh, very interesting. Um, it's um, a, um, it's a sort of uh, what's it? Oceanologist um, f following a trawler, a sort of fishing trawler in the Irish Sea, and they come across a a, a, a sort of very Lovecraftian, very rhizomatic um, creature of the deep, of the deep sea, sort of like tentacular, um, you know, group of creature. Who knows? Uh, but it is very interesting and quite uh, beautiful in parts and quite gruesome in others. Uh, and I do recommend it. Uh, that would be mine. I've got others, but Kate, if you got one, I am drawing an absolute blank on any film I've ever watched. Um, so I'm going to have to deny you that answer. <laughs> Well, that's fair. Okay, well, we all have those blank spots. Um, we've got a, a. Is this a question for Lenny or more of a, a hypothetical? Uh, Lenny, you're welcome to come on if you want to ask it directly. The ideological upshot of imagining different ways of being. Hey guys. You're right, Lenny. Uh, yeah, I, I was kind of thinking out loud, really, but it was a question because I, I, I've been thinking about the end of the world. You know, given that I'm old and near death and it would kind of be a relief if the world ended before I did um <laughs> and I, I you know obviously we we think as critics don't we about um you know the function of what we do as critics whether in watching these films and writing about them and thinking about them it, it or at least I do um it offers us any kind of escape from you know the systems in which we we find ourselves ensnared other than a kind of um aesthetic escape or a or a momentary you know voyage into fantastic realms and i don't know anything really about um eco criticism um although and although i have engaged with the text that you were talking about um i was just wondering you know what you saw i guess the political purpose of of reading texts in this way is both for yourselves and for um, for the critics that you engage with, you know, in the production of your own work. And I was interested in in whether um, whether there's more. Go and this is a genuine question, you know. This isn't um, a kind of you know snarky, you know, all we can do is frolic in the ruins kind of question. Um, you know, how how radical are eco critics? Um, is there a vision? Because um, I, I, Frederick did use, um, you know, the, the phrases like, you know, imagining the ocean being a space in which we can imagine other other ways of being and other ways of sort of organising. Um, you know, I'm interested in in radicalism in these texts. Is there any kind of programmatic? Is there any sense of, you know, um, overcoming the insistent individualism of, of you know, late capitalism with a mode of sort of collective organisation? Um, is there a 
way of um, reconceptualizing class consciousness and revivifying that as a kind of, you know, challenge to the spiral into identity politics. Um, you know, how how radical is this stuff? Um, and that is a totally genuine question. Thank you. Super uh, wants to field that first. Has the potential okay, to be super radical if it, you know, has the balls to um, take on the end of the world. Um, it's a really good question and it's one that pops up quite a lot within I guess science fiction as well like I know um oh, which critic is it um Amitav Ghosh is is fairly on the side of us uh, I think Ursula K. Luke no Margaret Atwood who says that science fiction is good but it's not going to help us think through our actual problems whereas you've got someone like Kim Stanley Robinson who's like well it well it has to because what else is going to um, and the, I think fiction allows this this multiplicity and variance of perspective that is similar in some ways to like social theory. And I think that the eco gothic or the eco horrific texts um, that manage that the best are the ones that are a bit more grounded in the contemporary or extrapolate from the contemporary in order to showcase the negatives of it but also how you can overcome it and they of course will not be exactly applicable because everything is informed by context either locational or geographical or political but something like moon which i think is a really good example of the eco gothic even though it doesn't have a scrap of like there's not a single leaf in it i don't think the eco gothic needs plants necessarily i think plants have their place don't don't shoot me friend or Theresa. um but i think you can have a a sense of the eco gothic without it being a traditional sense of the eco gothic like moon i think is very much about this radical sense of people are currently positioned as um objects within a system of neoliberal capitalism what are you going to do about it and the conclusion of moon is you got to take the system down and moon's moon's not clear about whether that will succeed but its value is through i don't want to say class solidarity because that makes it sound like i'm starting to wear flags but yeah solidarity is the only way and communal responsibility over any sort of individualization is the only way that i think the eco gothic manages <laughs> thanks lenny supportive fred you yes. to take it <laughs> i I'm start to get marcel in a minute if i keep going <laughs> um wonderful question thank you very much lenny uh in terms of answering it i'd say that i don't know if the weird the ocean and weird in this case can have can be programmatic in this sense, um, I think it's the one thing is, is the idea of the more you read, the more the more perceptive perspectives you look at, the more you yourself can be more open to other ways and be able to to create a more open society. But I, in terms of how creating new ways of being in the ocean as from this sort of fiction way can create a, um, a radical change. I'm not quite sure because uh, we in academia we quite we can see the divide between you know the sense of being critics and of and, you know finding ourselves you know submerged as it were in, in in books and criticism and all this and the fact that most of these questions or these thoughts are not necessarily um, covered by the public every day uh, or, or 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 looked at in this way and will they actually promote change? I think yes, in the grand scheme of things, but it's it, part of it. It's it, it, literature does that, you know. You look at it's in a sense it's graphic when you look at Rachel Carson's uh, writings, uh, whether on the oceanic in general or the or or, or the the um, eco criticism. These that have been written 50, 50 or 60, 70 years ago, they do have it has had an impact. They've 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 created new generations of critics, and they've are read by the general public uh and so i think it's with every other sort of source of, of of criticism it will have an impact i think but in the long term in the long run and not by itself it'll be a cop-out answer just to, just to support your cop-out answer right now wasn't a cop-out answer it was great um i think it also the 
the value of fiction generally, but also cinema and the weird, the gothic and the horror and sci-fi. I'm, I'm biased, but I think they're all valuable in their own specific ways. But I think there is no way to articulate or comprehend the complex totality of the Anthropocene because we're all some of us are in one country and in one place and within one area of an intersectional relationship with everybody else and nobody can cross all of those divides and it's about raising a certain level of understanding of where how all those pieces fit so all those pieces can come together rise up and you know overthrow the government <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to sound too much like a liberal but um obviously but isn't isn't our humanity that which enables us to transcend um, those times, those places, those cultures? Um, I, 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 again, I, it's late and I'm talking too much, but I, <laughs> I, I am just interested in the in the sort of uncentering of the an anthropos from the Anthropocene, um, and I'm interested in in humanity as transcendent um, characteristic. But again, that makes me sound like a liberal, so I'm going to shut up. Um, thank you. Thank you both guys. I wondered, Kate, if you'd seen Severance yet. No. Oh, oh, it's on my list. I'm so excited yeah. for it. It's it's right on my it. street. You'll <laughs> love it. I knew I would. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thanks, well, Andrew. as much as I'd love for this to spiral into us overthrowing the government on a Zoom call, uh, we do actually have to tie the threads together in some meaningful way now. Um, Alicia, are you, st are you still there? Are <laughs> you ready to do some uh, closing Look, remarks for us? I didn't disappear, don't worry. Um, right. So unfortunately, as Ollie's pointed out, this, our final seminar has to come to an end. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Frederick and Kate for two fascinating papers and talks and also like very fruitful discussion after. I'd also like to thank our audience because um, this wouldn't be possible if you guys are in here, we'd just be talking to ourselves, which would be fine, but would get kind of boring after a while. Um, you can, of course, relive this moment and rewatch these in our other seminar, <laughs> and other seminar talks on the MMU Gothic YouTube channel that Zavi has posted the link in the chat. Um, our series is, is essentially meant to showcase the, the wonderful postgraduate gothic research going on at the university so it's really great that you all have come out and to just hear what's going on uh, with our work. Um, a few things as a friendly reminder, um, the Manchester University Press uh, discount code is in the chat. Um, it's good until June I've been told so you can of course use it. Of course there's wonderful titles in the, in the gothic section so go forth and buy. Um, keep a lookout for Dale Townshed's um, seminar series as well. I believe it's called Creative Critical Dialogues. So now that we're ending, there are other things that you can be a part of as well at MMU. Um, there is a Gothic reading group that's going to be on June 1st, and they're reading Carmen Maria Machado's Her Body and Other Parties. Um, so that I think is 5.30 to 7 or 5 to 7 on the first. Um, so uh, the also the Vibrate link was also put in the chat by Zavi. So this is all convenient. Everything's in the chat. Um, and also, if you are a current MMU postgraduate student and want to get involved in the organization of these series for next year, kind of get in contact and kind of reach out. Um, it's, it's a good way to get involved to kind of see other research and have the experience of organizing kind of events. So yeah, with that, uh, thank you everyone for coming and I hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone.